record on this computer. All right. We're on. It's actually recording. Right. Well, okay. we're continuing on. It's really a real North Melbourne Central idea that I come up with this a number of weeks ago that I thought in this time of coronavirus and no football for possibly maybe till the first week of June, it looks like we are to borrow the line, we're flattening the curve and we could be back seeing some footy sooner rather than later. But I thought, what can we do for all the North Melbourne fans out there? Uh, last week, we were lucky to have the great Jason McCartney. And then I thought, who can I follow it up with? Well, that continuum of greatness. I've got the shin boner of the century, Glenn Archer. Arch, how are you going, mate? I'm very well, of course. Um, just at home, obviously, in isolation. Just trying to keep my sanity. Um, <laughs> I don't like to be fenced in. So, you never, you um, never were. You, you were. You're not good at being in those tight spaces. If anything, you'd go through the tight spaces. I, I would have noticed over the journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's obviously it's strange for everyone, but I think the thing that bothers me the most is, is I just if they gave me a date and said, yeah, you've got to, you're going to be, we're going to be like this until. June the 1st, then in my head I can work to it. But yeah. the, the unknown does me head in a little bit. But um, I'm starting to get used to it. Just doing, I'm going to end up like Arnold Schwarzenegger after this. We'll build a gym at home and all we do is lift weights all day. <laughs> and then I don't reckon I've had so many blokes seen so many pictures of their backyards and their decks. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of blokes that are they're vying for the title of Better Homes and Gardens. The great uh, Alfie Katz, even he sent me a picture of his deck today and he was all proud of his new decking and whatever. And I think a lot of people be flat because Bunnings wasn't open today. Yeah, no, I'm actually doing some landscaping around my pool at the moment. Um, bit of an insurance job because I, we got caught up in a hailstorm. Oh, you did um, too. So, yeah, we had a, had a landslide and my pool disappeared. So I'm getting new tiles and basically a new pool and a new garden. And I actually painted my daughter's room last week now that's a job that is a bit mind numbing <laughs> i'm not sure if i could do that every day well, my, my old man's painted the entire house so you talk about mind numbing i think he's got it nailed so uh, it does freshen the place up a bit though now i've done the one room i think i might move on to the next room <laughs> <laughs> well this is what i mean it's like everyone it's like everyone's in the nesting stage and they're getting ready to sell their house yeah, I know. Well, you wouldn't want to be selling in this market, but no, 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 no. <laughs> no look, Everyone's happy. Good. Yeah, but no. Look, I, I thought. Look, we can have a bit of fun today. There'll be a bit of lightheartedness. Um, maybe a few tips from Arch about how he can. He's been through some. We've all been through some tough times, but gives people some advice and some hope out there. But I thought I'd start with what I thought was particularly funny, Arch. The fact that you grew up a stone's throw from Waverley. And one of your first experiences, now we've got a predominantly North Melbourne audience, that you were seen running out to stop Kerry Good kicking a goal against your beloved Magpies in the 1980, was it 1980 Escort Cup Grand Final? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was seven years old. Um, lived, yeah, like you said, I lived just across the road. So I was there with my brother. Mm. Uh, he was five years older. Um, and we were right down on the fence um, and the siren went, Malcolm Bly kept playing, kicked the ball down to Kerry Good. We heard the siren. We, we started jumping on, on the ground and um, so my brother threw me over um, and then we couldn't work out why Kerry Good was having a shot at goal. So um, <laughs> well, I better stop him. <laughs> yeah, we were yelling out, you cheat. And the siren went and we were, we were rushing at him, trying to, trying to put him off and... Yeah, ironically, a few years later, <laughs> I was playing for that team. Well, it didn't really, it didn't really stop there because uh, I know you, you made history. You were on the ground when Gary Bacanara had his famous shot in the prelim final uh, to put the Hawks into the grand final. So where were you when he actually had the shot? Were you on the ground for that as well? No, nah, I was on the Hawthorne bench oh, at the well, time. Of course you uh, would be, yeah. <laughs> so we, we we spent every weekend at Waverley, no matter who was playing. And so we, as kids, we ran that joint. Um, we said, never paid once, jump the fence, 
And we worked out, well, I worked out that my um, key for my locker at school fitted a catering uh, elevator. <laughs> yeah. There was a, it was a key one. Yeah. So that the catering elevator used to take you down into the club room. So we'd just wait for the game to start. Then we'd shoot down into the uh, the rooms. Um, and it was all open them days. You'd just walk into the rooms. They had mm. a pie warmer there. We'd have ourselves to a pie. So that particular game, that 87 prelim, we'd wandered down the race to the bench halfway through the last quarter. Mm. Um, and they must have looked at us and thought, oh, well, they're just might be director's kids or something. So we, we were standing there. Bacanara took that mark or got a free kick, got the 50 meter penalty when Steins ran through the mark. Yeah. So the whole bench got up and onto the uh, onto the ground, onto the boundary line to watch the kick. And so we just followed him. So when he kicked it, if you go back and look at the vision, you'll see a blonde headed kid with a pink and white jumper. I'm probably the first one there jumping, jumping over Bacanara. So that's <laughs> We had some good times. We used to terrorise. We used to terrorise the blue coats. There was these two particular blue coats, the security guards at Waverley. Mm. We terrorised them for ten years. You know, we because they they'd, try, uh, they'd see us jump the fence, they chase us, and then we'd go up and we get the little milks, you know, from the yeah, yeah. from the uh, up, and we'd throw milk at them and carry on. And so, ironically, I'm 19, 18, 19, whatever I was, when I played my first game at Waverley, I walk in with my bag. The two guys that were um, guarding the rooms were the two blue coats <laughs> that I'd been terrorising for 10 years. And I thought, oh, shit, I wonder if they're <laughs> well, And they probably thought that you were trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And they've gone, no, nah, we finally got you. <laughs> well, they didn't even notice me. I showed me pass and they said, oh, Good on you, mate. Have a good game. And I walked past and I thought, oh, only if you knew. <laughs> if you knew what I'd been doing for you for 10 years. They're thinking that this bloke's very toey about his first game. You're, you're more toey about the fact you're not going to get in because you terrorised him for 10 years. Yeah, I thought they were going to finally get me back. <laughs> and then it did, uh, it did actually continue on for one more because we were actually, we didn't know, we didn't know each other then. This is like 1990. And... John Longmire needs four goals to uh, kick his 100th goal. He ended up kicking two goals eight. I think I was in the Collingwood cheer squad. Yeah. But I know that you were there as well, and you pretty much told Horse, and we actually joked with Horse many years later, like you actually said you were going to jump the fence and, and punch Horse if he kicked his 100th goal. <laughs> I was. Uh, again, at Waverley again. So, yeah, I couldn't believe it that day. And, um, yeah, so it was 1990. Yeah. And I... I me and you were Collingwood supporters and we're, you know, yelling abuse at all these North Melbourne players all day and then a year later, <laughs> we're playing with them. And that's, um, that, I suppose... That was, that, uh, pretty quick. And that, yeah, I know. It's amazing how quickly that it was funny. Even I was playing golf at, at Tullamarine with, with people in 1991, which I'll get to in a minute. And then some people hadn't seen me for a couple of years and the next minute they're turning on the TV and wondering... Hang on, I was playing golf with that bloke last week, and or only not that long ago. And next minute, you're on the TV and you're actually playing footy for North Melbourne. Yeah, it happens real quick, doesn't it? Um, and when they played that game this year with with no uh, no crowd, mm. people were going, "Oh, what it was going to be like for them?" I said, "Well, we did it for twelve years before we made made it in the AFL. We never had a crowd, so mm. it wouldn't be that foreign at all." Yeah, it's not that foreign. And then, it, as, I, as I touched on it, it's quite interesting when you told the story on Fox Footy, we're trying to match up. You had two blokes. So you, we fast forward to 1991. It's the last year of the under-19s. Both of us barrack for Collingwood. Both of us, our favourite players, Darren Mullane. And neither of us actually wanted to play footy for different reasons. You wanted to continue playing footy at Noble Park with your mates. I wanted to keep playing golf. But I think we'd worked out the timeline. And in successive weeks... Dennis Pagan had gone against all his principles and told either of us, I think, in successive weeks where he said to you, right, you, I'll let you tell the story about yours and then I'll tell the story about mine. Yeah, well, I actually did pre-season in 1990, um, but I only lasted about three weeks uh, under Dennis. Yeah. One, I wasn't really into the fitness stuff back then. <laughs> um, and I, I just, so I was always last in all the running and the running was ridiculously hard. 
Um, and even in the ball, the, the ball work, I just felt like I was out of my depth. So mm. I lasted about four weeks and took off back to Noble Park. <clears throat> and I played, played in the under 18s that like year at Noble Park. And the next year, I just went up into the seniors, started playing senior footy. And got a phone call from Dennis. It would have been around three, four, five, something like that. Yeah. Of ninety-one season, and him, him just saying, "Just come down and play a game." And I said, "No, nah, I'm right, thanks." And uh, he rang about ten times and said, "You don't have to train. No, no, come down to training. Train this week, and then you can play on the weekend." So I go down on the Tuesday. I go out and train. Again, I felt like I was out of my depth. I'm thinking, oh, "What am I doing here? I don't, I'm not going to make it." So I went back on the Thursday. Um, you know, didn't have mobile phones at, then. I couldn't ring him, so I had to go back down on Thursday. Didn't take my gear. I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not playing. Um, and he goes, oh, you're kidding yourself, son. You know, <laughs> you've got something there. All right, don't train tonight. Just come back on Saturday and play. And I was like, oh, this guy's relentless. So, yeah, went down and played on the Saturday. I was a forward then, kicked a couple of goals, enjoyed it. But, oh, well, I'll hang around for a little bit. And... Uh, <laughs> Seventeen years later, I was still years there. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if it wasn't if it wasn't for his persistence, because I was never on the radar of any club. Uh, I didn't play till carp. I didn't do anything like that. I was a good junior footballer, but I wasn't a real standout. So uh, Greg Miller and him saw something that I, I didn't see. Was it um? And he actually played in our under nineteen team. Was it a couple of the guys that were from around your area? Was it um? I know, yeah. yeah Dean, Dean Hillbrick. Yeah. Uh, Justin. Um, yeah, Dean, Dean was a... He was a sad case because he was an unbelievable player. Yeah. Greek. Um, and he, he should have made it. He should have played a lot of senior footy, but um, got caught up in the wrong crowd in Dandenong and, and uh, went down a different path, which was unfortunate. We are... Um, and while we're... Actually, you talk about blokes that had... A, a, a massive amount of talent and never played a game of footy. And I know there's a lot of people out there that know him, but how about the talent that was on one J McNamara? Johnny Mac. Yeah. I know. We, we talk about him all the time about talk about a, a waste of talent. Um, he was probably the most talented football I'd ever seen, uh, particularly with his, his marking right foot, left foot. You didn't know which foot he kicked with. Um, and didn't never play the senior game. It was on North List, Geelong, Essendon. That didn't play. I, I just couldn't believe that. Do you remember the goal that he kicked in the? I think it was in the prelim final. I don't know whether you remember about this far, but I was injured. I didn't play in the prelim final, and I don't know how I got. I went straight back in for the grand final in 1991 because I think I'd hurt my knee. Um, yeah. But Johnny Mack has probably still kicked one of the best goals I've ever seen when he was playing centre half back. Ran down the wing at Victoria Park, had three or four bounces, kicked a torp on the run that went over the back of that net at Victoria Park, and then he just strutted back to centre half back. <laughs> yeah, and there is vision of him in the '91 Grand Final because it was televised by Channel Seven. Then with him spinning the ball on his fingers, spinning the ball on his playing, head. Playing, up, <laughs> playing up to the crowd. I remember Ross Glenn Denning was the special comments. Man, going. Uh, I think he said something along the lines of, "I oh, wouldn't be doing that, son. You're getting out yeah, of yourself." I like to see that in young blokes. I think he says up to the words to those effects. Um, uh, look, and then I, I sort of half know the answer to this question. But when, when do you think in those early games for you was a game where you actually thought, "Hang on, I've actually like I actually think I've got the talent to go on and make a career of this," or were you still on edge for a while? But we, did you have a game where it suddenly clicked in your head and you went, hang on, i am actually got a pretty good future in this game? Oh, no, that took a while. I know the, my first year, I, I know I got a game round five or six, 92 or something like that. Um, I on Gavin Brown. And, yeah. yeah, that was later that year. Um, yeah. My first game was against Carlton. Had about four touches. MCG overwhelms. Um, uh, felt really out of my depth and then I think I played another game the week after um, played against the Bulldogs and I was horrible like shocking yeah um, then got dropped back down to the reserves 
And I played about two or three more games in the reserves and I got best on ground in the reserves and I was actually that worried that they're going to put me back to the seniors that I didn't turn up for training on the Thursday. <laughs> and I got a phone call from Keith Gregg. He was the chairman of Selector saying, why aren't you at training? And I said, oh, I've, um, I've got an exam for trade school. I've got to, got to study. And uh, he said, oh, well, we're going to put you in the seniors this week. We can't now. You can't just not turn up to training. Um, so I was actually trying to avoid getting kicked in the seniors. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I got put back up again, dropped back down. And then it was the last three games of that year I played Richard Osborne, uh, Anderson from Essendon, and then Gavin Brown in the last game against Collingwood. <coughs> Didn't beat him, but uh, sort of held my own against them. And I got a bit of confidence from that, thinking, oh, yeah, if I can hold my own against them, I might be, I might be able to play for more games. Did it give you a huge amount of confidence playing on for someone who barracked for Collingwood and then you're playing on someone that we all idolise with his attack on the ball. And by the way, I actually do remember that game because I, even I thought, like I, even I knew at the time, I was watching something pretty special that I'm watching two bulls effectively go at it. And the way you two went at it was unbelievable. You, but you must have got a huge amount of confidence playing on someone like Gavin Brown and then going, hang on, I, I think, yeah, I, I think I can go on. Yeah, yeah. I remember that game. That was so nerve-wracking. Obviously, coming, you know, barricading for uh, Collingwood all my life and then coming up against, obviously, playing on Gavin Brown. Peter mm -hmm. Dacos was playing all your heroes. It's such a weird feeling when you go out there. Um, but, yeah, I I actually went the other way. I thought, I don't really want to get overwhelmed by him. So, I actually started to mouth off to Peter Dacos at one stage, <laughs> and uh, which he wasn't happy with. He wanted to kill me. Um, but I, I, just, I thought I don't want to be intimidated by him, and so I had to. I went the other way and I tried to intimidate them, but it didn't really work. But it made me feel better. You know what? It's actually a big lesson for everyone out there that's actually watching this. That I know that you know, Archers it goes down as one of the toughest and most courageous players that's ever played the game. But I know that you used to have. You would nearly think of what would go wrong going into games, wouldn't you? Like you, like even, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but even before the 99 grand final, like you, you have a nightmares about Lance Whitnell being best on ground and whatever, but this is someone who won the Norm Smith. How did you get, like, how would you then get in the right frame of mind that you get over yourself and be able to perform? I think in the, it wasn't a good way to th um, think because, you know, you're on edge, you've got anxiety, <laughs> you throw up all the time. Um, but I just, when I think back to it, I go, well, it actually got onto the ground. Yeah. I had all these horrible thoughts come through my mind, you know, you know Whitney will kick in 10 and we lose the grand final and it's a shit feeling. Um, so once I got to the, onto the ground, I thought, I don't want that feeling. <laughs> I want to do everything in my power not to get that feeling. Um, so yeah, people always talk about positive thinking and, um, back yourself and all that sort of stuff and obviously that works for a lot of people but um, if I sat there and thought um, oh, how good am I, am I and mm. thinking about taking marks and kicking goals and whatever um, that would this wouldn't work for me so I, I went the other way I thought about what if this happens what are you going to feel like and it was generally oh, I'm, I'm going to feel horrible so I don't want that feeling yeah and then well, obviously, then you're playing in the back line. What's it playing in the same back line as Mick Martin? And then if you talk about going into the biggest of big games and then you've got Mick that's playing on Tony Lockett, describe that experience and describe the, the really good talk that you used to get from Mick and about calling you back and, and, and not letting Plugger run into you. <coughs> yeah, I did speak to him before that grand final. And I said, because Dennis had already told me I'm playing in the back pocket playing on Craig O'Brien, but uh, even Craig O'Brien had a really good year that year, he goes, but I'm not too worried about him, it's Plugger, so I need you to come off Craig O'Brien as mm. much as you can and help out Mick. And the other thing I used to do a lot before games was visualise, so I spent a lot of time in my room, closing my eyes, visualising, putting myself in different situations and how I was going to react. Um, so I started visualising 
you know, coming off Craig O'Brien, Plugger and Mick behind me. I'm thinking, she was 240 kilos between the two of them. Um, if they hit me hard, they're going to kill me. So I better go speak to Mick, <laughs> tell him plan or tell him what I was going to do. So I went and saw her and I said, Mick, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come off. I'll get in the hole as much as possible uh, and try and help. I go, but please, if I get camped under it, just let me let me know because so I can brace myself. And uh, I reckon it was five minutes into the grand final, ball gets kicked out. All that visualisation comes back. I leave Craig O'Brien, get in the hole, can't hear nothing, just sort of relax and mark the ball and just smack straight in the spine. Freaking Plugger and Shrek rolling all over, <laughs> over me. And <laughs> Plugger used to get me head as well and whack it into the ground and, and go, get out of that effing way. And so I get up and go, Mick, say something. He goes, oh, yeah, next time, Mark, next time, next time. <laughs> he did that all day. In the end, so people after the grand final, I win the Norm Smith and they go, oh, you won it because you were so courageous. You know, you got in front of Plugger. So it had nothing to do with courage. I didn't even know he was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you had no prior warning as to what was coming. <laughs> so there was nothing courageous about that. If I knew he was coming, then it might have been courageous, but I never knew all day. So, uh, no, I, I did love playing with Mick though. One thing about Mick, he was a bloody beast. So he could pick up on, you know, like if he wasn't there and then I had to stand on Dunstall, Lockett, Modra, Kernahan, these blokes, it'd be impossible. So when you think about someone who was a key to our yeah. team, that was Mick, to be able to play on them blokes week in, week out and do really well on them it was, it was amazing. Not that you put a lot of faith in those uh, those ratings that come out, but I was, yeah, if, if you're doing the ratings, I know that if I was doing the ratings, mix by far and away easily in your top ten. You know what I mean? Because we don't we don't go and have the success that we do without Mick being that pillar at, at full back. And like Pago said, you know, gorillas need to play on gorillas. So and and Mick to be able to do that. There was only a couple of times where players really got a couple of hold, uh, got a hold of him. There was the famous one at um, at Princess Park that du uh, Duck loves telling the story about that one. But um, but you think over the journey that no one really got a hold of Mick in a real big big way, and we wouldn't have had the success if he if he wasn't back there. It would have been, as you said. I mean, it's either you or Jace McCartney or someone else that's having to stand on. I mean, these real big beasts. Yeah. Uh. Actually, they did that top 20 in the Herald Sun recently for North. Um, was were they, Did they have Mick in the top 20? Well, they did, but they had him like in the bottom. I, I tell you, there were two, a couple that I took exception to. When you've got, I mean, you've got Mick at the bottom end of the teens in that. And the other one that I think is, um, yeah, they probably got it wrong a little bit. I mean, when you've got Shannon Grant in there and, you know what I mean, if you're talking about, yeah, I thought that Shagger and also Kingy wasn't in there at all. So, I mean, there, there you go. Like, you're talking about people that are... If, you, if you're talking about sort of 10 or 12 guys that if you're going to go into a game of football that we were going to play and you say, right, these are my absolute dozen that... I know we're talking 20 of what they gave us, but if you said there was around a dozen-ish, those sorts of guys, it, it, it's hard. I don't know how you could leave them out. Yeah, yeah. Kingy, was a, that was a mistake. If he's not in the top 20, it was an emergency for the team of the century. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> best of all time. So, yeah, they, they, they made a blue with that one. Um, yeah. And I know when we did the top 10 for North of all time, we had that dinner last year. <clears throat> one of the They asked me to write down my top 10 that I played with. I tried to work out all the errors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that and that was hard. It was actually hard, really hard to do that. But, uh, yeah, I had Kingy in the top six or something so yeah, yeah they made it they, they made a blue with that they made a fairly good blue now the great uh ralphie horowitz has asked me a question he's asked me on twitter he's asked me about the the famous lenny hayes incident now i actually have a part to play in that if you've ever seen that footage because i was sort of borderline dribbling the ball nearly across the boundary line and then I think, sorry, I was right behind Lenny Hayes, so I was sort of just corralling him. But I'm nearly half responsible for him getting killed as much as anything because I could actually see 
the spirit of progress coming out of my right hand side, which happened to be number 11 coming at a bull at a gate. So I just stopped and then let you do your thing. So when you got him at the time, yeah. did you think he nearly killed him? I knew, no, I knew I got him good. Because um, <laughs> you hear the wind come out of blokes if you get him properly. Get hit the solar plexus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to his credit, he, he got up and kept going. So, um, but we played in Sydney that game and it was a tight game. I, always, I remember it. we won. Um, and I remember coming home the next day or that night or whatever, back to Melbourne. <clears throat> and I remember going into the bedroom and um, I said to the wife, that was a good win, wasn't it? And she goes, well, why did you hit that kid? I go, well, because oh, I'd forgotten about it by then. And she goes, um, I said, what are you talking about? She goes, that kid had played his first game. Why, why would you do that to him? I went, I don't know. He was there. What, I just ran into him. What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, so I went from... <laughs> thought I was going to have a conversation with, oh, well done, Dale, good win and all that sort of stuff. And she told me off about hitting Lenny Hayes for five minutes. If, uh, I went to sleep in the bedroom. If, yeah, as, as we all do. Um, if you actually remember, that was the fifth or sixth game of 1999 and we'd actually got off to a pretty poor start. When we won, I think when we won that game, we ended up winning about 12 or 13 games in a row. So it was on the back. If we hadn't have won that game, we were down. I'm pretty sure we were down at half time and then we managed to come back and as you said we actually won the game yeah yeah so I remember the duck wasn't playing um yeah for memory I think the start of that year we were about four and one or one and four or something at the start yeah I think we were um, either one and three going into that game and if we had a loss we I think we might have gone to one and four yeah, yeah. so yeah now we uh it was a fair fight back to Go from one and three to win in the grand final. Yeah, exactly. Now, your great other half, and I'm not talking about Lisa, the other half of Bert and Ernie, um, Steve-O, what was um, described for people like uh, out there, like just, we all know what a fantastic teammate he was, but what was he like as a roommate? How, was he annoying? Yep. It was, uh, <laughs> I, stopped rooming, I stopped rooming with him at the end. I went and got my own room. Yeah, he, uh, I don't know, I'm a little bit anal, you know, I like to be clean, make sure everything's got its spot in the room and he'd have crap all over the place. Um, he ended up in my bed one night over in Perth. Um, it was when we had all that trouble, obviously the Wayne Carey incident. We, um, it wasn't long after that, we had to go to Perth and play a practice match. Yeah. Um, so we, me and Steve, I went over there, but we didn't play. But obviously his mind was all over the place at that stage. Yeah. But uh, so during the night, I, I woke up and I could feel someone next to me in my oh. bed. And I looked at him, I go, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> he goes, I don't know. I said, get out of his bed. He, he didn't go to his bed, he goes to the curtain and hides, starts hiding in the curtains. And because he was like sleepwalking. So I had to go get him and put him back into his bed. I went, yeah, that's about it for me. I'm going to go room on my own from now on. Now, you do remind me of a very funny story. A lot of people out there know um, the great affection that, or you guys in particular, or we all did. We all had that affection for Marinepi, um, who, for all those North Melbourne supporters out there, remember Marinepi, um, brilliant young, uh, young kid that used to come into our rooms. Um, but the thing is, Marinepi and his sense of humour, whilst he has got cerebral palsy, he is as sharp as they come. Like, I can have conversations with him about Manchester United and he's Liverpool and we have this banter. But tell everyone out there about um, when you took Marinepi to Vegas and when you woke up in the morning and he was rocking backwards and forwards on the ground and you actually thought the worst. And this shows you his sense of humour, what he actually said back to you. Yeah, so we, we took him on the footy trip and so he roomed with me. And again, for those who don't know, cerebral palsy in a wheelchair, but he can get out of his chair and he can walk on his knees, you know, he can move around a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we, he slept in my bed every night because his carer slept in the other bed. It was about the fifth, you know, the last night, I think, or the last morning I woke up and he, he's not in the bed. You've actually got to put him in the bed. So I'm thinking, how's he got out of the bed? Um, and then I looked out on the floor and he's on the floor like this, convulsing, 
And I absolutely crapped myself. I thought he was having a seizure. And I said, hey, Murray, Nappy, what's the matter? He, he stops, he looks up, he goes, I'm doing my push-ups, you dickhead. Made <laughs> <laughs> me sit-ups. He was doing his sit-ups. I went, oh, my God. Uh, okay, give me a heart attack. I thought you were dying. It just shows his, his sense of humour. He was, uh, I'll tell you what, I know that he's obviously got cerebral palsy, but, oh, God, that just sums him up to an absolute T about what he was like. Now, we've actually joked about this. Now, we, the night where you actually shaped up to duck, obviously well publicised. We all know that Wayne is very good at holding them up. Now, I think it was a street fight. I think you'd be good. But then I've actually worked out the perfect solution. I've been speaking to Dana White, and I think we can organise a UFC fight. And, th- and we can just settle it once for all. Nah, no way. <laughs> I'm not getting in that. He, uh, I've seen him fight in the ring and outside the ring. So he would be good at UFC and boxing. So, uh, no, of, uh, sometimes you just got to know your limitations. The man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting, unless I've got a baseball bat, I'm not getting in there. Yeah, you're not wrong. Now, um, speaking of other tough men, got a question from Aaron Ramsey. We all know Aaron Ramsey. Uh, I think you know Aaron pretty well. You might have met him over the journey. Aaron Ramsey asked, what are your thoughts, speaking of a, a tough man, on Cam Zerha? Cam Zerha? Yeah, I love him. Oh, obviously, he's hard not to love. Cam, this way he plays. Um, he Does he remind you of anyone? Uh, yeah, well, he's def- definitely hard at it. He runs in straight lines. Um, and you know, particularly these days, forwards have they've sort of lacked that a little bit now. Like yeah. forwards just won't, they won't crash packs. Yeah. Um and that's what, what he brings. Um and if he's not if he's not getting a lot of the ball, he's uh he puts a few of the defenders on edge. So uh, hopefully obviously last year was a good year for him. Um hopefully when he gets back out there again he keeps just keeps playing the same way. You know, know what his strengths are. And his strengths are just attacking the ball hard. He was uh, in that patch of games that we had where Fer- Reese first took over. Like The one that sticks in my memory was that um, it was the game against Richmond and he, I think he had Dustin Martin in tow and he gave Dustin Martin a don't argue. Now, he ended up getting... He slightly stood out of bounds, but it summed yeah. him up to a T. And that summed him up how we were playing that night. Like, it was like, we don't care who you are. And it summed up, that's what I love about when North, when North, or when we play like North Melbourne, where we go, we don't care who you are. We don't, what talent, we don't care what talent you've got, but we're going to take you on and play our brand of footy. And that's what really summed it up that night. Yeah. And, yeah. North play the best footy that's are up, you know. So if they can start for the opposition, because <clears throat> offensively, I reckon we're really good. Yeah. Uh, as soon as we get ahead of ourselves a little bit and stop, and t- uh, you know, take the foot off the pressure side of things of the opposition, then we're in trouble. So you, we played that one game against St Kilda, first half horrible, uh, defensive wise. Obviously, Reese pulled them into the line at half time, got the defensive side going in the second half, and they won the game. How um how great was it after that game? By the way, you and I had a bit of a chat about it. But was that one of the best versions you'd ever heard of joining the chorus in your whole life? I know that we'd had versions that we'd belted out, but that was it was epic. Yeah, have you got a lamb in the background there? No, nah, it's a brother-in-law's child that's uh, having a little hissy <laughs> fit at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that rendition after the. After the game, yeah, that's that's the best one I've seen. Um, yeah, it was brilliant. Obviously, yeah, a little bit more new age. Uh, they stepped it up a little bit. It had a bit of beat to it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it was great. Well, hopefully, we can hear that soon because we're not. Yeah, even though I'm not a massive watcher of footy, yeah, um, except North. I just, North, I don't really watch other teams. Um, yeah. But now it's been taken away from me. <laughs> I just want to watch something. Well, I've mentioned this a few times on social media, Arch, that 
you would never have thought. There's no excuse now. That even the 440 game at a Marble Stadium where we're playing Gold Coast Suns, you're expecting every every North Melbourne fan that that instead of being an 18 or 20,000 crowd, you're expecting 25, 30. And don't, if you ever want to think back, think back to remember what it was like when you couldn't go to the footy. So go to, when you get the chance, go to every game of footy. Yeah, absolutely. Don't, don't take it for granted anymore. Because 100%. We've actually got to start living our life um, imagining that we've got three years until COVID-20 comes. Yeah. So I reckon that's once we get out of this, to say, right, and we need to actually live like there's going to be another pandemic in a couple of years' time. So make the most of it. <laughs> Have some fun. 100%. Um, now, I was actually going to ask that. Like, what's, what's your advice before we leave? I know there's a lot of people that might be out there doing it tough, but what's your advice? Like, you've been through some tough times, like in footy and, and different aspects to your life. What, what do you do when you... I mean, where you need to hit the reset button and what do you do? Is it like what you're doing now where you're going to the gym and trying to keep your daily routine? But what does is, what is Glenarcher do to stay on top of things so you don't go mad? Well, the key is, the key is um, exercise. Yeah. No, there's no doubt. And even if you're not massive on exercise, you've got to do something. If you, you can't just sit in the house the whole time. Yeah. Um, I see with my kids, my kids are older, but 22, 20... 17 and 14, <clears throat> five o'clock every night we train together. Um, oh, family fitness, we call it. <laughs> really? uh, um, and I see, I see an immediate effect straight away. So five to six we train, um, gym, do some running and whatever. And then from six o'clock onwards, their, their whole, uh, they're, they're changed. They're, they're, they're happy. They're laughing. They're taking the piss out of each other and, um, yeah, you see an immediate effect straight away. But if you uh, yeah, if you get in the fetal position for too long and just lay on the couch, uh, one, it's not good for your health, and two, it's not good for your mind because you, you start thinking of the worst all the time. So, yeah, my advice is just do something. Even if you, you're not a... Just walk. Just go for a walk or something. And everyone out there, this is coming from a guy who said he hated doing fitness. He actually did use those words before if you have to go back and who, David Butterfoot would be proud of you right now, Arch, the words that are coming out of your mouth about physical fitness and staying active. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I definitely turned it around. Johnny Blakey was the one who taught me how to train, actually. He yeah. lived around the corner from me. So, um, we would finish the season, um, and within two two weeks later, he'd be knocking on my door saying, okay, we're going for a run. And I'm like, oh, we're, no, we're going to the pub. We go, no, no, no. We go for a run first and a swim, some weights, then we go to the pub. Right, okay. Um, but yeah, I, I got that ingrained in me now. I, I, I train every day. I run it. One of the lucky ones, though, because I've, I've got no injuries. So, very lucky. Yeah. And look, that's probably sound advice to everyone out there. Like, whether you're doing it with your family and doing an activity in your own house, but even in the, the current environment, and I know we've got to obey the rules, but even all those people out there, even if you can get a mate around the corner and just go for a walk first thing in the morning and clear your head and just work out what you're going to do for the day and just have some goals and things like that. And, you know, I mean, just, you know, I mean, and, and you know what, you can think of all the things like Art said, it's very, very sound advice that, you know what I mean? Think of down the track, all the things that you're going to do that you, okay, pretend that might come back in three years time. So, do, do everything while you can, but write a list of all the things that, are, that you're going to look forward to, meaning we want to see about 25,000, 30,000 people to those interstate games and no empty seats. Yeah. Actually, while well, we're on the topic of supporters, <coughs> they've been brilliant, our supporters. I've got over 37,000 members, sure. and uh, we've only... We've only um, I think we've given out eight refunds for people's memberships. They're the people that rang up and said, you know, we're doing it tough, we're gonna to have to get our money back. Yeah. But the other th um, which is fair enough, absolutely. Um, but that's eight out of thirty seven thousand. So there's thirty seven thousand members there that have said, nah, keep my money. Um, I'm fine. So we're uh, we're very, very lucky. 
And we're uh, we're sitting at thirty seven, which is still good. I know it's a good total, but let's get it up to let's get it up to fifty. Let's get a serious total going and get as many I know that for many years we might have had a bit of a, you'd know more than this arch, a bit of a churn rate in terms of the supporters jumping on and off. But we know there's a lot of people that year in, year out and um, as Arch mentioned, I know it's pretty tough out there, but yeah, we uh, you know, I mean you you love having a big crowd of North Melbourne supporters. I know that it's a lasting memory of mine running down to that end uh, grand final day. And it was a, to have a sea in blue and white when we're not like uh, Richmond and Collingwood and the big teams, but to see even an army, even if they're condensed in one section, is stuff that lives in your memory. So, Yep, no, absolutely. Um, I reckon we will get the 50. Once, you know, obviously not this year, but... Um, come next year, I, I, I think our highest is 45, um, maybe 46. So um, there's a lot to look forward to. Yeah. And again, let's not take it for granted. <laughs> let's buy a membership and go to the games. 100%. Because they could get taken away from us again. Yeah, exactly right. Who knows what happens. But look, I know that, um, look, all we're trying to do in these uh, times like this, and, and then I thought, you know what, who, who better, who owns the... The, by the time this lands on uh, social media and platforms, it'll be in a time slot that we used to own. And I thought, what better time than in, in the time that the Kangaroos used to own and to give all the footy supporters out there, in particular the North Melbourne supporters, had Jace last week. Uh, hope you guys have got a huge amount out of it this week. It's been great to chat to my old mate as I think he's having a... What are you drinking there, by the way? Uh, I was having a cordial... <laughs> I thought it might have been something a little bit stronger. No, I had a few beers last night with me daughter and wife and had too many, I think. So I was, uh, been, I was been a bit dusty today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but look, on behalf of everyone, thanks, mate. We'll make this land and uh, let's hope that we're all back at the footy pretty soon and uh, seeing lots of kangaroos wins. Beautiful. Thanks, Corsa. Thanks, mate. Cool. Pause.